I'm Dan Barker. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. We're executive directors of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. What do we really know about the religious landscape of our country? Our guest today, Ryan P. Burge, has some surprising revelations. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. Our guest today, Ryan P. Burge, is a professor of political science at Eastern Illinois University. He specializes in religious demography. He's the author of the 2021 book, The Nuns, Where They Came From, Who They Are, and Where They're Going. As you can see, nun isn't spelled N-U-N, it's spelled N-O-N-E, and refers to those of us with no religious affiliation. Also, and you may find this surprising, Ryan Burge is not only a professor, but a pastor of an American Baptist church. Ryan Burge's newest book is 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America, where he postulates that the, the way most people think about religion and politics is only loosely connected to the actual empirical data. So, Ryan Burge, welcome back to Free Thought Matters. I always love being with you both. Thanks so much for having me. So, Ryan, you're a pastor, yet as a professor, you're best known for tracking the growth of the nuns. Yeah. How did you get to be an expert in this, and do you ever feel conflicting feelings as you report about the nuns? Yeah, so it, it happened organically, I have, to, I have to admit. I sent a tweet out a couple years ago that showed that the nuns now were larger than evangelicals or larger than Catholics, and for whatever reason, it took off. I mean, it just went like wildfire on social media, and CNN called me, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Times of London, everyone wanted to talk about the nuns. And so whenever I got approached about writing a book and they said, well, what topic would you want to write about? I thought, well, why, why not write about the topic that everyone wants to talk to me about? And so, you know, the nuns was the first thing that came to mind. And I knew that no one had written a book that was statistically rigorous, but also accessible to a general audience. And I, I know that's sort of my lane. And I thought I could do a good job of doing both those things at the same time. Do I feel conflicted? Yeah, I do feel conflicted. I mean, I, I have to live between two worlds, right? I have to live in the academic world, which is very, you know, nonpartisan, non-biased, as objective as we possibly can be, but also a pastor. And so a lot of times I'll, someone will ask me a question during an interview, and, they'll, and I'll ask them, do you want me to answer that as a social scientist or a pastor? And, and sometimes they'll say both, which I don't know how to do both. I, I kind of wear one hat on certain days of the week, and I wear one hat on other days of the week. And depending on what audience I'm speaking to, they want something different. You know, they want a different perspective, my own opinion. When I write, though, I try to be as objective as possible. I try to kind of pick my own ideas of things out of the story and just let the data speak for itself. Well, I think we want your professor hat on for this. <laughs> Wonderful. I can do that. So I really like your book and what you're saying here. You, you combine, you have a picture on the front of a, a pulpit, and then there's all these like data graph lines going up and down. In fact, they even go to the back of the book. Yeah. So you're talking about religion, which to a lot of people is a matter of the heart, but you are talking about it empirically, uh, demographically, with, with graphs. Uh, you write in your book that you, you don't know how many graphs you've ever written in your life. In 2020, you wrote what? 1,500? 1,500, yeah. And I think it was 1,300 last year, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm slacking off a little bit. But I make... I don't think people realize I make graphs probably 300 days a year. Yeah. If I'm bored, I make it. Other people quilt or sew or hike or play sports. I don't do any of that stuff. When I'm bored, I make a graph. To me, it's like 
it, it scratches my curiosity itch. Like I'm just interested in like in a topic. I'm taking a shower and I think, what is the what is this between that and this? So I'll go make a graph. And then if I think about it for a second, I go, well, you know what? I should share this with other people and see what <clears> they like and see. And actually, where a lot of my book ideas come from and article ideas come from is actually giving trial balloons online and seeing what people really bite. You know, and see what they find interesting and then build that out into a more, you know, full conversation. So social media has been great for me to try different ideas out and see what people want to hear about. Well, when, uh, we follow you, of course, on Twitter and, and usually what you're tweeting are graphs. That's it. I don't I don't put my personal life up there. I don't put pictures of my kids and my dog or my wife. I love all of them very much. But, you know, that's my professional view, right? It's just, here's what the data says, especially when you're talking about religion and politics. It's so easy to get inflamed and angry. My job is just to kind of roll the graph into the room and say, okay, you guys figure out, you know, what this means and why this is the way it is. I don't try to interject my opinion too much. I want the conversation to kind of flow naturally on social media. And I think that's been my biggest benefit is kind of being an impartial referee for everyone. So that way that no one thinks I'm trying to sell a narrative one way or the other. Well, the graph is visual and we are visual animals and seeing a picture kind of says a lot more than just hearing a lecture about percentage changes and, and all of that. So so you're onto something there. Yeah, so, my biggest nightmare is I go give a talk and the projector breaks. Because uh, I'm like, I don't know, I don't know how to do what I do unless I can say, look at this graph and look at that line. So for me, you gotta be visual when you give a talk. It makes yeah. it so much more interactive and better. So your book, Twenty Myths About Religion and Politics in America, what prompted you to come up with a book like this? I just, I, 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 you know, I, I scroll through, you know, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram, and you see people say these things that I just know are false. Like the data is just clear as day that that's not what the world looks like from a data perspective. And I wanted to kind of give a more concrete uh, form to kind of refute a lot of the things I've heard and seen and read. So that way, whenever so when I see someone on social media saying, well, this causes this, I can point at the sign and go, look, this book right here in this one chapter, I spend 5,000 words telling you why you're wrong on this. And the other thing about that is, and I was very intentional about this. I wrote that book in such a way where there are some chapters, they're going to make conservatives feel really good and liberals feel really bad. And there are some chapters that are going to make liberals feel really good and conservatives feel really bad. And religious people are going to feel really good in some chapters, and they're going to feel really bad in other chapters. You know, my goal is not to cater to anybody but the truth. You know, what the data tells me is what I, my job is to tell you all that. And then you guys have to kind of, you know, make that work in your own life. But I'm not, I'm not, I don't work for a team. Team truth. That's what I tell my students. We should work for team truth wherever that takes us. Yeah, you're right. There are some chapters in here that I wonder about, you know. <laughs> That's good, though. That's what I want. In in that, in you know, like I've had I've had experiences where I've sp spoken to you know to you guys in the morning and the Christian Broadcasting Network in the afternoon, <laughs> and I think that's great. You know, I think we need more people who don't just preach to the same congregation over and over again, where you can kind of go across partisan lines, across religious lines, and say this is for everyone, not for one person. And I think that actually. It's part of my success and my reach is because I've been so objective and tried to stay so neutral in doing this kind of work. So did you get any pushback from your book about the growth of the nuns that you felt like you needed to respond to in this book? Well, so not in that book. Well, actually, there is a, there is a chapter or two in there. That's, like for one is that people get uh, more religious as they age. That's when you hear a lot online. Like, um, you know, it's like a life insurance, right? You get close to death and you're like, you want to, you know, go back to church so you don't go to hell. Um, if you actually look at the data, people do not become more religious as they age. I looked at every, I, I broke the data into five year birth cohorts, so like people born between 1940 and 1945, 1945 and 1950, all the way up to people born in the 1990s. And in every single birth cohort, there's a larger share of non religious people today than there was in 2008. So it's every single birth cohort is less religious. It's not just young people. And people are, they're not becoming more religious as they age. Actually, they're becoming less religious as they age. Well, this That's is something I wish have. I would include in the number. This yeah. is what we find because our average age is in the 60s. In our group. In our group with 40,000 yeah. members. 64 yeah, is the average I, age. And I don't think that a lot, a lot of people, when they think of the nuns, they think of like a 22-year-old, you know, Nietzsche quoting college student. And I, my job is to kind of say, no, 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 it doesn't look like that at all. It, they look like, the nuns look like America now. There's so many of them. It can't just be one thing anymore. And, you know, it's, it's every age, it's every gender, it's every race, it's every partisanship, it's every education level. 
when you get to be 30% of the population, you're not just one thing anymore. You're everything. And I think people, Christians and non-Christians alike, need to understand what this group really looks like, not their characterization of what the nuns look like. So on the other hand, here's a uh, chapter that I was wondering about, mm-hmm. and, and this is good that you brought this up. You say, one of your chapters, is it's a myth that evangelicalism is in decline. And we kind of thought with the growth of the nuns and evangelicals, are, and Christianity is obviously shrinking in the United States. So why is it a myth that evangelicalism is in decline? It's a great question, and I think this is actually something I want to write more about going forward, because I think there's this misconception that as religion declines, all religions will decline. What we're seeing is that the number of evangelicals in America today is the same number it was in 1993. About 75 million Americans are evangelical. On surveys in 2008, 33% of Americans self-identified as evangelical. Today, it's 34% self-identifies evangelical. So the share of Americans who are evangelical has not ch- changed substantially at all in the last 10 or 15 years. What I think is happening to American religion, and like I said, I want to write more about this, is we're seeing the really religious people, you know, like your conservative Catholics and, and your evangelicals and um, your uh, Orthodox Jews and people like that, they're not going anywhere. They know what they believe. They are very clear in what they believe. They are not shifting or changing. What you're seeing is the nuns are rising, but they're rising because moderately religious people have become nuns now. You don't see a lot of evangelicals and Hasidic Jews becoming nuns, right? Traditional Catholics, that kind of thing. It's the people that were in the middle of American religion are now picking a side. They're going to become very religious or not religious at all. So we're seeing religious polarization in America, just like we're seeing political polarization in America. And I think we're in it's going to lead to a much more contentious future and by the way you are seeing this already in michigan they are having a a school board meeting about book bans and evangelical christians stood up in favor of book bans but you know who stood right next to them muslims conservative muslims were standing right next to them they're joining hands on that one side because they all they they don't believe anything the same about god and theology but they believe the same things politically and culturally and they realize they can have common cause there I think you're going to see a lot more of that going forward is very conservative people on one side and nuns on the other side and very few people between those two poles. Well, it's interesting that you said there's 75 million evangelicals because there's about 75 million unaffiliated. The nuns are about the same. That's right. And I think the the issue, though, is – and I'm actually going to write a piece about this. I think that atheists are probably going to be, in the next 10 or 15 years, the most consequential voting bloc in America. If you look at their political activity – um, 51% of atheists gave money to a candidate or campaign in the 2020 election cycle, 51%. Um, for evangelicals, it was 25%. So, you know, atheists are smaller numerically now. They're about 7% of the population, and evangelicals are, depending on how you measure it, 20%, maybe 22%. So numerically, atheists are smaller, but they're punching way above their weight when it comes to you know uh, impacting the political discourse in this country and election cycles. So once they get larger, they could be more impactful than evangelicals, even though numerically they don't have the same size. Or what's yeah, so the you're, younger you're generation? You're missing my thumbs voting. up when you were talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an important part of the conversation, though, is we think atheists, listen, they are the perfect element. They have high education. They have high income. They're very politically engaged and they all and they're they're very well they're very by the way um atheists are the most liberal uh religious quote-unquote group in america today and they want to pull the democratic party to the left um and i think that's a really important part of what the future of american politics looks like because when you have a group that's very loud very well educated very organized and wants to pull a party to one side or the other i think they have a lot of sway in the political process going forward and we should say that the nuns are three in ten right about 20 20- Nine percent right. of the adult population, more of more Gen Z are are nuns, but oh, not over 40%. all the. How much? Up over over forty percent of Gen yeah, the, Z. Yeah, your statistics are really amazing on that. Um, yeah. But, but not all nuns, N O N E S, are atheists or agnostics. That's that's a very important point, and let's talk about that for a second. You put five nuns in a room, one's an atheist, one's an agnostic, and three are nothing in particular. That's the option they get on the survey. Literally, it says, not, it's like the last option, none of the above, nothing in particular. They are 22% of the population. Amongst 18 to 22-year-olds, they are one-third of the population. Actually, amongst 18 to 22-year-olds, the most chosen option on surveys is nothing in particular, more than Protestant, more than Catholic. So that is that group is actually huge. 
The problem with them, though, is they're not very politically engaged. They have low incomes. They have low education. So they're a lot harder to um, mobilize and organize in a political uh, you know, situation. And they're hard to find, too. Like, how do you find a nothing in particular? They don't form groups. There's no, there's no you know, you know, Atheist United or nothing in particular is of America. They don't exist like that. So that's the problem with them politically is they don't have any structure yet. But they might in the future. Yes, as they get older. That would be a good group. The nothings in particular of America. <laughs> well, we're, we're going to take a break. We're talking to researcher Ryan Birch. And when we come back, I want to talk about a, a myth that you say is a very strong one about abortion rights. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I'm Ryan, and I'm an out-of-the-closet atheist. Ever since I was young, I've always been taught to ask questions, ask why, and use the scientific method to see how things can be improved. I learned early on that this doesn't work at church, at least not for long. You'll see the hypocrisy and the inaccuracy of everything. I think that we should eliminate religion and treat each other with dignity and respect as people inherently do. Religion is divisive, and I think we can all be good people without the lure of eternal salvation or the threat of eternal punishment. Welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're continuing our conversation with political scientist Ryan P. Burge about his new book, 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America. So let's return to some of, of what your book identifies as myths. And you have a chapter about abortion. Can you talk about that? Yeah, there's the one thing that you hear is when you talk to evangelicals or talk about evangelicals, what a lot of people say is, well, they vote for Republicans because the abortion issue. They want to make abortion completely illegal in this country, and that's why they want to vote for Donald Trump or whoever else. But if you actually look at the data, what I show in the book is at least recently, in the last two election cycles, white evangelicals care just as much about immigration as they do about abortion. I actually think even the evangelical voters would rather take an anti-immigrant pro-choice politician over a pro-life, pro-immigrant politician. And I think that's one of the reasons Donald Trump did so well in 2016, because he was clearly the most anti-immigrant of all the Republican candidates. And they and Trump used that against Cruz and Rubio, saying they tried to work for a pathway to citizenship. He hit them with that. I think that's one of the reasons that he won over the evangelical vote so early is because he was so anti-immigrant. I think abortion is important. For evangelicals, but I don't think it's the you know the deal breaking issue, especially in a post Dobbs world. They got what they wanted when it comes to abortion. So why would they continue to go in that direction when the Supreme Court gave them exactly what they wanted? I think it's going to fade in importance in the years to come for evangelicals. Well, that would be nice. That would be very <laughs> welcome. Uh, so speaking of Donald Trump, uh, you have a kind of a big myth in there that the myth that Donald Trump wasn't the choice of the religiously devout Republicans. And why is that a myth? Uh, if you if you read in the run-up to the 2016 election, especially the primary season, you know, when Trump started winning the early states, New Hampshire and Iowa, places, South Carolina, places like that, the narrative began to form that the reason Trump was being chosen was because he was the choice of non-religious Republicans. The, the real evangelicals voted for Cruz or Rubio or someone else. I have primary data. We asked people in the middle of the primary season, who did you vote for? Republicans in the Republican primary. And Donald Trump won amongst never attenders, amongst seldom attenders, amongst monthly attenders, amongst yearly attenders. He even won a majority amongst weekly attenders. The only group that he didn't win were those Republicans who attended church more than once a week. 
Uh, Cruz won there by about 10 points, but that group is only 10% of all Republicans anyway. Trump won the other 90% who went from never attending to weekly attending. He was clearly the choice of most Republicans, regardless of religious attendance. Well, how many non-religious Republicans are there? So that's an interesting question. It's growing, okay? Um, over time, it's probably about, in a primary situation, it's probably a little bit less. About 15% of Republican voters in a primary are um, non-religious. It's probably closer to 20% during a general election season. But we see that number growing every, you know, every two or four years as the number of nuns grow. Obviously, most of them are Democrats, but more and more of them are Republicans. And I think the Republican Party's got a serious problem. You can't continue to rely on the votes of white Christians going forward because the share of America who are white Christians is declining rapidly over the last 10 or 15 years. They've got to find a way to reach out to, let's say, like libertarian nuns, which there are some of them in America. And when a group becomes a third of the country, you got to start figuring out a way to bring them into your coalition. And they fail to do that so far. Well, this has been our mantra. Why aren't politicians wooing the nuns? How can they question. ignore a third of the country? You know, we have to pinch ourselves to know that we exist sometimes when we listen to politicians. I wrote an op-ed, um, which hopefully will land somewhere. When the new Congress was seated, Pew always does this really great say where they look at the religious breakdown of the incoming Congress. Um, there's only a handful of members of Congress, House and Senate, who don't identify with a religious tradition, and only one or two that are actually out as being nuns, religiously unaffiliated. When you consider 30% of America is nuns on the ground, but you know less than 1% of Congress is nuns, that's a huge disconnect. We talk about you know having Congress look like the American public when it comes to gender, when it comes to race, when it comes to education. We never talk about it in terms of religion, and I think Congress needs to start looking a whole lot more like the, the people of America look like, especially when it comes to religion, and that's something we just don't talk about very much. Well, now, I'm, I'm in, brother. <laughs> now, for the first time, though, we do have the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, and some of them are openly non-religious, so that's that's a little bit of a move in that direction. And I actually gave a presentation to that group, by the way. Um, oh, they asked you? me to, yeah, a Zoom presentation over the summer. And they actually, I think the Democratic Party is going to invite me to come talk, you know, more about the, the non-religious and what they mean for the future of America in the next couple of months. So the Democratic Party, at least, is listening to this changing demographic and want to hear more about it. And hopefully I can kind of tell them the numbers and the numbers don't lie. It's a group you can't ignore anymore. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask a question that you don't talk about in the book, about methodology. Um, and, and I've read it, I'm sure you have too, that there tends to be an over-reporting or under-reporting. Uh, th most of this data is based on self-reporting answers to questions. And we, we do know that people tend to exaggerate or under-report. Under do you have to take that into account, or do you just go with the pure numbers? So I'm, a, I'm a believer in if people tell you who they are, you got to believe them. You know, and if, if you say you're an atheist and you go to church every week, then my my perception is that's what you are. You know, for instance, like the word evangelical, we ask people they self-identify as evangelical. And we ask that question, by the way, of everyone, not just Christians. We ask it of Jews and Catholics and and even atheists. We get we ask them the question. And what you interestingly enough see in the data is we're seeing a lot more Muslims, for instance, self-identify as evangelicals and Catholics and Jews. And if you look for what factors lead to that, it's almost always because they're Republicans. So they're seeing the word evangelical actually not be like a religious or theological word. They think it's like a cultural or political word. And so I'm more interested in how the average American thinks about what the word evangelical means or atheist means or non-religious means. I don't want to tell them what those words mean. I want you to tell me what those words mean. And me, my job is then to figure out like how you got there. You know, Mentally, how did you arrive at that location? So I'm a big believer in if people say they're an atheist or say they're a Protestant, that's what they are in my world. So regardless of what might be under the surface, you can track the change over time of people reporting whatever that means, you can see that change or growth, right? Yeah, and we, and, and actually, um, there's something called panel surveys, which I think are great. They ask the same people the same questions at like various stages, like every year, every two years. So you can actually see movement across the religious landscape at the individual level over a period of eight or 10 years. And you see these fascinating things. Like for instance, some people will say they're not born again in 2012, but then they're born again in 2014 and then not born again in 2016. Or people will say they're Protestant at one point and atheist at the next point and then agnostic at the next point. So you kind of see like how volatile the American religious landscape is if you track people individually over time and yeah. ask them the same questions in the same way. So Ryan, did you have some um, mis 
misunderstandings when, when you were researching this book? Did you discover you had swallowed some of these myths? Oh, absolutely. I think a lot of more things that I believed that the data had to continue to tell me that that's not true. And, and the biggest one, the, the one that I use the most is the idea that religion and education are inversely related to each other. That's the one you hear a lot is that people who are more educated are less religious. That's actually technically not true. More educated people are more likely to identify with a religious tradition. Now, there's one area when that's not true, though. Um, educated people are less likely to declare a firm belief in God. Like, I believe in God for certain. The more educated you are, the less likely you are to say that you have a firm belief in God. But the more likely you are to attend religious services, and the more likely you are to identify with religious traditions. So it's actually very um, nuanced. It's not a clear black and white education, religion. It goes both ways. So our survey of our own members in 2020, and uh, we had a huge statistically relevant response, is that the Freedom from Religion Foundation members are much more educated than the general public. Many more of them have undergrad degrees or, or grad or, um, you know, PhDs. And, so, and I think that's, I think atheists are a special type of nun. Like when we talked about, you know, most nuns are not atheists. And I think atheists, atheists are actually are the one of the most educated groups in America. They, half of them have a four-year college degree. For nothing in particular, it's only 25% have a four-year college degree. It's um, atheists are as educated as Jews and Hindus in America, 51 percent. And I think that's going to continue going forward. The divide between the nothing in particular and the atheists is growing larger culturally, economically, educationally as every year passes. Well, thank you, Ryan Burge. This is a fascinating book, 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America. So keep dreaming up those graphs. <laughs> every day, it's every day, to, guys. You, I don't know how many you have in here, but it really makes it a fun read. So thank you so much for, for being with us today on Free Thought Matters. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.